begin by simply listening. Slow down and see just how peaceful today can be. Welcome. Uh, this is going to be Orson Welles, Julius Caesar, and Shadow of the Colossus. Uh, it is my honor to be here with you. And here we go. The beginning is a very delicate time. Know then that it is the year 10,191. The known universe is ruled by the Padishah Emperor Shaddam IV, my father. In this time, the most precious substance in the universe is the spice melange. The spice extends life. The spice expands consciousness. The spice is vital to space travel. The Spacing Guild and its navigators, who the spice has mutated over 4,000 years, use the orange spice gas, which gives them the ability to fold space. That is, travel to any part of the universe without moving. Oh yes. I forgot to tell you, the spice exists on only one planet in the entire universe. A desolate, dry planet with vast deserts. Hidden away within the rocks of these deserts are a people known as the Fremen, who have long held a prophecy that a man would come, a messiah, who would lead them to true freedom. The planet is Arrakis, also known as Dune.
the Mercury Theater on the air. Columbia Broadcasting System takes pleasure tonight in bringing you the first of a new series of weekly broadcasts by Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the Air. Two months ago, this brilliant Broadway company came to radio as the first complete theatrical producing unit ever to take the air. Hailed by stage critics as the brightest moon to rise during recent years over New York's legitimate theater, the name of Orson Welles has become a byword to the greater Broadway of the country as a whole. After nine weeks, this is what the radio critics say. The radio dial declares everything was well nigh perfect. A feather in the cap of the Columbia Broadcasting System. Bill Byrd and the Pasadena, California Independent Units. The program sparkle with originality, cleverness, and skilled acting. The series suggests new avenues of approach in the development of radio drama. Says the St. Louis Democrat, a master of the theater, be it stage or radio... Mr. Wells' choice of classics is a master strike. A must for any listener, declares the Camden, New Jersey Post. And finally, the Cleveland Plain Dealer asserts, there was nothing in the production the ear could not see. It's now a habit for Orson Wells to produce his radio show. And so tonight, by overwhelming <laughs> popular demand, Orson Wells and the Mercury Theater on the Air open a new cycle of broadcast dramas with a radio production of their greatest stage success to date, Shakespeare Caesar. And here is Orson Welles himself to tell you about it. The director of the Mercury Theater, the star and producer of these programs, Orson Welles. Good evening. Julius Caesar was done by the Mercury Theater without benefit of toga. It was as timely last October as it was 1,650 years after Caesar's murder when Shakespeare wrote it. And it is as timely today. A glance at your newspaper headlines and you will understand why tonight we could wish for the extra dimension of television. Shakespeare's great political tragedy about the death of a dictator, which is also the personal tragedy of a great liberal, exists in all times without identification or special reference to its time. Its story is real Roman history, and its source is the Roman historian Plutarch. From the Plutarch text for the medium of radio broadcasts, we have arranged a running commentary on the action of the play. No voice is better known, and none could be more suitable than that of radio's outstanding news commentator, Mr. H. V. Kaltenborn. And so tonight, the Columbia Broadcasting System begins the new series of the Mercury Theater on the Air with Orson Welles' world-famous production of Julius Caesar, starring the original New York cast, Orson Welles as Brutus, Martin Gable as Cassius, George Coulouris as Antony, and Joseph Holland as Caesar with music by the celebrated American composer Mark Blitzstein and H.B. Calvinborn as the narrator. This is the history of a political assassination, the killing of a man who tried to make himself king. It is an account of how the murder was prepared, how it was carried out, and what happened later to the men who took part in it. When the Civil War was ended, Caesar was 55. By Pompey's death, he had made himself the most powerful man in the empire. His countrymen, in the hope that the government of a single person would give them time to breathe after so many civil wars and calamities, now made him dictator for life. Honors were conferred upon him, which seemed to exceed the limits of ordinary human ambition. This gave offense to those who looked with an evil eye on his position and felt oppressed by his power. A conspiracy was formed against him, headed by Cassius, one of Pompey's generals, whom Caesar had pardoned after the Civil War. But what gave the common people their first quarrel with him was their growing suspicion that he aspired to be king. The 15th of February was a national holiday, and there was a huge gathering of the people. As Caesar went through the streets, a strange voice was heard in the crowd, 
warning him to prepare for some great danger on the Ides of March. Beware the Ides of March! Bid every noise be still. Oh, no, shh. Caesar paused for a moment, and then, as the voice was still, marched on between the rows of soldiers who guarded him. Caesar, my lord. I hear a tongue shriller than all the music cries, Caesar. Soothsayer, bid you beware the Ides of March. Set him before me. Let me see his face. Come from the throne. Look upon him, Caesar. <laughs> he is a dreamer. Let us leave him. Forum, high above the heads of the people, so look at me. Go ahead. a golden throne had look been set him. for Caesar. Mark Antony, his friend, was consul at the time. When he came into the forum, the people made way for him. He went up and reached to Caesar a crown wreathed with laurel. Upon this there was a shout, but only a small one, made by the few who were planted there for that purpose. And when Caesar refused the crown, there was universal applause. Later, Caesar's statues were found with royal diadems on their heads. Marullus and Flavius, two tribunes of the people, went presently and pulled them off. For this, Caesar had them arrested. This was the day on which Cassius, the leader of the conspiracy, first came to Brutus, the most honored man in Rome, and tried to enlist his aid. Louder. Can you see your face? No, Cassius, for the eye sees not itself, but by reflection, by some other thing. It is just, and it is very much lamented, Brutus, that you have no such mirrors as will turn your hidden worthiness into your eye that you might see your shadow. I have heard where many of the best respect in Rome, except immortal Caesar, speaking of Brutus, and groaning underneath this age's yoke, have wished that noble Brutus had his eyes. Into what dangers would you lead me, Cassius? That you would have me seek into myself for that which is not in me. Therefore, good Brutus, be prepared to hear. And since you know you cannot see yourself so well as by reflection, I, your glass, will modestly discover to yourself that of yourself which you yet know not of. What means this shouting? I do fear the people choose Caesar for their king, don't I you people? Then must I think you would not have it so? I would not, Cassius, yet I love him well. But wherefore do you hold me here so long? What is it you would impart to me? 